Good evening, Los Angeles. It's early Monday morning in Jerusalem, 5 a.m. to be precise. End of the weekend for you. What would be a better time or day for the beginning of this new venture, Jerusalem Online, a live telecast via satellite, directly from Jerusalem to LA, prepared for JTN viewers by the Jewish Satellite Network. Tonight, as part of our program, we present the latest news as adapted from Mabat, the Israel Television Nightly News. Among other news reports, the arrival to Israel of Viktor Brailovsky from Russia, an Israeli soldier killed in Megiddo Junction, inauguration of Israel's 40th anniversary celebration, singers Yehud, singer Yehudit Ravitz, new performance, and in sports, Israel soccer leagues. In focus, a live debate in our studio with your participation, the Who is a Jew Amendment. Secular uh, Orthodox uh, clashes on Saturdays in Jerusalem. In short, religious pluralism in Israel. In the studio, we have as our guests a Labour Party member of Knesset, Simcha Dinitz, the former Israel ambassador to the United States. Likud Alignment member of Knesset, Eliyahu Ben Elisar, Israel's first ambassador to Egypt. Aguda member of Knesset, Rabbi Menachem Porush, former deputy minister for social welfare. You are invited to call and discuss the issue with our guests. Our telephone number is 818-701-3000. But first, with uh, more about tonight's new television venture, um, here is the president of JTN, Mr. Alan Block. Hello, I'm Alan Block, president of the Jewish Television Network in Los Angeles. Jerusalem Online is a dream come true for us. In this program, we're harnessing the power of telecommunications and television to bring together the peoples of Israel and the Jews of Los Angeles so together we can watch and explore issues of vital importance to all of us. Also in this program, we're bringing in two great principles of human experience. That of the democratic principle that governmental officials and leaders are responsible to their public. And two, that individuals in the Jewish tradition are responsible for the public sphere as well as our own private sphere. So you viewer, please get your pencils, pens, and papers handy to take down the telephone number you'll shortly see on your screen, call in your questions, and help us take part in this vital experience. Thank you very much. Well, once again, a reminder, should you wish to ask a question about relations, uh, pluralism in Israel, religious pluralism in Israel, call 818-701-3000. The three members uh, of Knesset will be waiting for your calls. Eli Ben Elisar, Simcha Dinitz, and Rabbi Menachem Porush. But first, the news. Israel returned to work today after three days during which the country came to almost a complete halt. The Shabbat followed Rosh Hashanah, first of the three high holidays. The next holiday is Yom Kippur at the end of this week. There are um, minutes, and these are the last minutes, prior to Rosh Hashanah in Jerusalem. Slichot worshippers left their homes at 4 o'clock in the morning in order to arrive in time at the Western Wall. The sound of the shofar was heard throughout the land. It was an extended New Year holiday, which both secular and Orthodox Jews prepared for. Religious and traditional Jews spent a good part of the two-day holiday in synagogues. Colorful greeting cards for the New Year could be seen on display throughout all of Jerusalem. Many Israelis prefer to send their holiday regards in the form of flowers. Already at 5 o'clock in the morning, flower stands were arranged and sellers were ready for the busy day ahead of them. The widespread custom of gift sending between families and friends and from employer to employee ensured that florists, toy makers, confectioners, and beverage salesmen all would benefit from the festive mood. Especially popular were the sweet challah and honey cakes, which both attracted long lines at the bakeries. Spirits. 
is wonderful. Everyone is participating. The excitement, uh, buying the challah, going to synagogue tonight, uh, and the fact that everyone is Jewish and everyone uh, is involved in the, in the wonderful spirit of Jerusalem and the holiday. And with this holiday spirit, the freshly baked buns were quickly snatched away. While most Jerusalem residents spent their holiday in the synagogues, others chose to get away from it all. Megiddo, reserve soldier Alexander Arad, was buried yesterday afternoon at Kibbutz Ramot Menashe. Arad, 43, father of two, was stabbed to death by a suspected Arab terrorist early Thursday morning. He was waiting to hitch a ride uh, for the Megiddo, from the Megiddo Junction. Shortly after the incident, a border police unit arrested a suspect who police said was, has confessed to the murder. The suspect, a 23-year-old old Palestinian, uh, has served a prison term for a security offense. Security forces uh, demolished his home last late Friday night. The public sector wage agreement was signed yesterday after four months of exhaustive uh, negotiations between uh, Treasury and the Histadrut Labor Federation. The agreement gives public sector uh, workers a raise of 75 shekels in their monthly salaries starting in November and sets a limit of 45 work hours per week. The agreement also stipulates that the work week will be shortened from six to five days by the end of next year on condition that the next wage agreement uh, in the two-year pact, uh, the new agreement expires in six months. Former prisoner of Zion, Viktor Brailovsky, arrived in Israel on the second night of Rosh Hashanah with his wife and children after finally receiving an exit visa from the Soviet authorities. Here is a report from Ben Gurion Airport. Because of the holiday, no ministers came to the airport and there were no speeches, but it was still a very festive occasion. Viktor Brailovsky had waited 16 years for this moment. Especially during the years when I was in prison, when I was in an alien country, when I was in a very difficult situation, I dreamed of the time, of the moment, when I would have such a reception here in Israel. Brailovsky and his wife, a mathematician whose departure was delayed for years because the Soviets claimed she had access to secret information, will now work at Tel Aviv University and other research institutes. And so Viktor Brailovsky, the first immigrant of the new year, begins a new life in Israel. President Chaim Herzog last week declared the beginning of the state's 40th anniversary in a ceremony which took place at his Jerusalem residence. On the inauguration of the 40th anniversary of the State of Israel, I know that the whole of world Jewry is celebrating with us just as they stood with us in the critical hours when we fought for our independence. And I would like to take this opportunity to associate the world Jewish community and in particular the, uh, uh, those who are uh, watching this program uh, with uh, our uh, holiday here and to uh, wish them a very happy new year and uh, all that is good for the Jewish people in particular and for humanity in general. Forty years ago, the U.S. General Assembly resolved, U.N. General Assembly resolved that a Jewish state be established in part of Palestine. Uh, when the War of Independence ended, Jerusalem was divided. Eastern Jerusalem was not part of the state for 19 years. It was during the Six-Day War that the capital of Israel was reunited. This year marks a combined celebration, 40 years to the state, uh, 20 years to the unification of Jerusalem. Uh, the state and the city owe this achievement to a number of great people. We would like to bring you a short reminder through the eyes of one person who was greatly involved in both events. 1948, the besieged city of Jerusalem. The western Jewish part of the city is being continuously shelled and sniped at by the Jordanian army. Food is short, even water is rationed. 
convoys with food, ammunition, and reinforcements can hardly make their way to the city. Arab gangs are ambushing, blocking the roads. A bypass road is found, the Burma Road. The Haganah special units, known as the Palmach, are fighting on the road to Jerusalem and within the city walls. Recalls a battalion commander at the time, Uzi Narkis. It was an army without enough clothes. It was an army or a brigade without enough rifles or machine guns or even ammunition or uh, grenades. It was an army of people who believed in what they were doing and were ready every minute to sacrifice themselves for the independence of the state, the Jewish state, which would be called Israel eventually. The day the establishment of the state was declared, the four villages of Gush Etzion fell into Jordanian hands. The Palmach succeeded in opening a path to the Jewish quarter and the Western Wall. The path was not open for long. The Jordanian army conquered this area as well. As the commander of the operation that rescued Mount Zion from the Arabs and succeeded to penetrate through uh, Zion Gate into the Jewish quarter of the whole city, the defeat was that we couldn't hold. It was too strong for us and too difficult for us to hold the corridor between us, Mount Zion, and the Jewish quarter. This is a real taste of a defeat. Nineteen years later, General Uzi Narkis, Commander-in-Chief of Central Command, gave the order. Paratroopers, tanks, the Jerusalem Brigade, and the Air Force fought once again for Jerusalem. 1967, the score was evened. Jerusalem was united. Once again, Jews were able to pray at the Western Wall. I was there to take advantage of such an opportunity of relieving the old city of Jerusalem, of uniting the whole city of Jerusalem, and making it a Jewish capital for the Jewish state. The sentiment is also of somebody whom destiny chose to be the one who leads his people, or in this field, his soldiers, to the most sacred remnant of the Jewish people, namely the Western Wall, the Kotel, with all the prayers, with all the sentiments, with all the wishes of next year in Jerusalem, during 2,000 years on his back. The state is 40 years old. Jerusalem is united now for 20 years. For the Jerusalemite, soldier, diplomat, and Jewish leader, this represents a lifetime achievement. Aliyah. The numbers of Olim this year already exceeds the total of last year, and it might suggest a change of trend. The head of Aliyah and Absorption Department of the Jewish Agency is satisfied with the current situation. Um, the uh, correspondent of JSN reports on new approaches in absorption. 35 Olim from the Gilo Absorption Center in Jerusalem already joined the first direct absorption experiment. Housing and employment were available immediately. The Olim were more than happy to move from temporary residence to a permanent place of their own. The experiment took place in Migdala Emek, a development town east of Tiberia, the location of Begid Or Fashion Factory and the Israeli plant of National Semiconductor. I myself am surprised at the success we are having at the, first, at the real first stage. You know, in 74, there was a year of 30,000 Olim in Israel. Only 6,000 were in absorption center. That's what we want. Now, we are promoting projects, if especially now in South America and in France, 
in order to bring people directly to development towns. The mayor of Camiel was in, in Latin America. He brought with him 63 families. The mayor of Migdala Emek is going. The mayor of Bechemes is going to France. So we are having a whole a complex of projects that will help us bring Alia into direct absorption. When asked about the Alia project from Los Angeles, this is how Chaim Aaron replied. I believe we have created a very, very good, very good infrastructure, a very good cooperation between the Alia Shalia and the people in charge of the project in Los Angeles. We have the very, very important support of the lay leadership of Los Angeles, especially at Winfield. And I believe that those conditions, that situation, is a guarantee that the project itself will be a great success. More than one million people in the United States were eligible to vote at the 31st Zionist Congress, which will be held in Jerusalem in December. The United States has 152 delegates, nearly a third of the total. In all, representatives of 27 states will participate. The organizer hoped to see many new young faces this year. Representation will be based entirely upon election results rather than political party dealings. In Basel, August of 1897, the first Zionist Congress was convened. Theodor Herzl made the declaration, at Basel, I founded the Jewish state. All the following Congresses served as a government for the Jewish people still without a state. Among the major issues addressed were Uganda as a temporary shelter for the Jewish people and the fight against the white paper which limited free immigration to Palestine. After Israel's independence was declared, a new chapter began for the Zionist movement. Their role now was to deal with immigration, absorption and education. In December 1987, the delegates coming to Jerusalem will be re-evaluating the role of the Zionist movement on Israel's 40th anniversary and the dangerous demographic situation of the Jewish people. This year, 40% of the delegates are newcomers to the Zionist Congress. The percentage of reform and conservative representatives has increased drastically. The 31st Congress is expected to be a lively one. Will it indeed be a Congress full of life? I put the question to the treasurer of the World Zionist Organization and the Jewish Agency, Mr. Akiva Levinsky. Yeah, I think this is going to be an interesting Congress, and as you said, a Congress full of life. And the reason is a very simple one. There is no other arena in Jewish life but that besides that very unique arena of the Zionist Congress where Jews from the diaspora and Jews in Israel can have a real dialogue. This is the only place where the concerns of Jewry today can be discussed, can be looked at, and I hope in some ways even some solutions might be found to things which seem to be nearly impossible today. The Zionist Congress will have to elect its executive, which will have to reflect not only Jerusalem and Israel, it will have to reflect Zionist movements in the various continents and countries. It will have to reflect those young people who want to more to be in Israel and realize Zionism. It will have to reflect the thinkers and educators and will have to reflect the various movements in Jewish life today. Abba Kovner, resistance fighter and poet, died on Friday at his kibbutz Ein Hachoresh. He was 69. Kovner became one of the leaders of the Jewish resistance and one of the commanders of the Vilna Ghetto Revolt. At the end of 1941, he published his famous manifesto calling for the Jews of Europe to resist and not to go like sheep to the slaughter. With the outbreak of Israel's War of Independence, he joined the Giv'ati Southern Brigade. His manifestos boosted Giv'ati soldiers' morale. In their difficult uh, times and fighting with the Egyptians, <coughs> the themes of his poetry ranged uh, from the horrors of the Holocaust to the landscapes and struggles of Israel. 
1987 was a momentous year for the arts. The Israel Philharmonic celebrated its 50th anniversary in a series of sold-out performances in Tel Aviv. Uh, at the uh, Jerusalem Israel Museum, Moshe Dayan's archaeological exhibition was open to the public. Notable ballet performers arrived from America and Europe. Sultan's Pool in Jerusalem, the Caesarea Amphitheater, <coughs> Tel Aviv Yarkon Park, and the Tzemach Amphitheater on the Sea of Galilee were filled to capacity. Uh, visiting entertainers included Tina Turner, Bob Dylan, the Eurythmics, Ray Charles, Miles Davis, Tom Petty. Perhaps the greatest success uh, was Israeli's favorite singer, Yehudit Ravitz. Here she is performing her own song, Coming from Love. <laughs> Coming from love, but not in sports, in their fourth soccer match of the season, defending champions Beitar Jerusalem scored a dramatic 2-1 victory on Saturday against Hapoel Kfar Saba at Bloomfield Stadium in Yafo. Here are some highlights from that game. The goal on the left, led by Parcelani. And there's a foul on the 16-meter line, which gives Hapoel Kfar Saba a penalty kick. And it's a great kick by Yaron Parcelani. The ball is free, and the Beitarniks are still waiting. And it's a goal! 1-1. One, one. Right past Malali. The ball's in midfield. Mamilian goes up for a header, and now it's a goal! And so Beitar Jerusalem leads 2-1. to one. And both the stands and the Beitar bench are rejoicing. An excellent goal by Yaakov Schwartz. We have opened this news bulletin with preparations for the holiday in Jerusalem. To close, we take you to a holiday resort elsewhere in Israel, the Sea of Galilee. Some 70,000 visitors flocked the shores of the Kinneret in this long holiday weekend. In the past, it was Sharm el Sheikh or Nueba in the Sinai Peninsula. Since its return to Egypt following the Camp David Peace Accord, the Sea of Galilee has become the new national holiday resort. The Jewish Agency Settlement Department decided to develop this area called Amnon Bay. The name is derived from its being the location of the Amnon fish rapid multiplication. The idea is a very simple and an economically based one. The Golan Heights needs to be vastly settled. Land resources in this mountain area is limited. The solution? Settlers will have tourism as a main source of income. The many Israelis who camped at the Amnon Bay this Rosh Hashanah proved that it was a right decision. So what more does one need when even a simple weekend camping trip becomes a Zionist act? And that's the end of our news bulletin for tonight. 
Now, before we move on to our debate in focus, may I uh, remind you of our subject. And it is religious pluralism in Israel. Three members of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, will be waiting for your calls. Please try to keep your questions short to enable as many as possible to participate. Our telephone number is 818-701-3000. Now, station break. Welcome to the Jewish Television Network, Los Angeles. Subscriber-supported cable television for Southern California. JTN programs bring our wide and diverse Jewish world into your home. Documentaries and feature films look at everything from black Jewish relations to Jewish homeless on the streets of Los Angeles. The Jewish Television Network needs your help. Become a subscriber right now by calling the number on your screen. And by joining JTN, you will play a vital role in the passing on of our great cultural heritage to a new generation. Thank you, and Shalom. Conflict between secular and ultra-Orthodox Jews on the issue. What character will the Shabbat have in the Holy City? To precede our debate, here is a report. Some call it the wars of the Jews. Others call it the Sabbath war. This demonstration in downtown Jerusalem is the latest clash between the city's ultra-Orthodox and secular communities. All the demonstrators, as well as all the policemen, are Jews. The ultra-Orthodox protesters, Haredim in Hebrew, are demonstrating against what they view as the desecration of the Sabbath by secular Jews. Last year, Haredi militants defaced or set fire to dozens of Jerusalem bus shelters in protest against what they considered to be lewd advertisements posted inside. This year, they've been protesting for six weeks against the recent attempt by commercial movie houses in Jerusalem to screen films on Friday night, the Sabbath Eve, which for them is a clear desecration of the holy day. Israel's Jewish population is pluralistic. It's made up of people with very different ideas of what sort of Jewish society Israel should be. The spectrum ranges from those who feel it should be completely secular to those who believe it should be totally theocratic. The majority of the population is secular. They don't observe religious laws, they don't necessarily keep kosher, and they drive their cars on the Sabbath. Another large section of the population is the modern Orthodox. They observe the religious laws with varying degrees of strictness and see no conflict between their religious beliefs and contemporary religious society. The ultra-Orthodox are a small but highly organized community, numbering less than 10% of Israel's Jewish population but making up about a quarter of Jerusalem's Jewish residents. The more extreme among the ultra-Orthodox deny the validity of the Jewish state, which they believe can only be established when the Messiah comes, and not by Zionism. Nevertheless, there are two ultra-Orthodox parties in the Knesset, Israel's parliament. The Agudat Yisrael and Shas parties wield considerable power, sometimes the balance of power, in Israel's coalition system of government. Over the years, they have managed to acquire state funding for their schools. Religious exemption from military service for their young men and all religiously observant women. And the grounding of the national airline, El Al, on the Sabbath. But the ultra-Orthodox consider these concessions from the secular powers to be only first steps along the road to their ultimate goal, which is the establishment of a Jewish state governed by religious law. Thus far from Israel, and now a point of view from California. The president of the Southern California Board of Rabbis, Rabbi Moshe J. Rothblum. Rabbi Moshe J. Rothblum, president of the Southern California Board of Rabbis, and I am delighted to welcome all of you this evening to this most historic program, a live satellite hookup between Los Angeles and Jerusalem uh, to discuss uh, the issue of who is a Jew. I think that it is particularly meaningful that all of you will have the opportunity 
to participate in the discussion by calling in, by sharing your perspectives, by questioning those who are going to be on the program. And again, it is an amazing thing that we are able to do this uh, electronically, bringing people together. Uh, our concern for Israel is a very strong one, and to be able to have this kind of dialogue and to have this kind of interaction, I think is extremely significant. Once again, a Shana Tova to all of you, and we look forward to your participation this evening. Shalom. With us in the studio here in Jerusalem are representatives of three parties. The issue is political no less than religious. Rabbi Menachem Porush of Agudat Israel, a non-Zionist Orthodox party. Simcha Dinitz, representing the Labour Party. And Dr. Eli Ben Elisar, representing the Likud Party. Our telephone number once again, is 818-701-3000. Now, do we have our first call, please? Sure, I Okay, you are. Hello. Hello, my name is Steve Solomon. I'm Good. from Encino, California, and my question is directed at Rabbi Porish. The Go. first question I have is, what is your feeling about Arabs in the Knesset deciding the issue of who is a Jew? And the second part, Rabbi Porish, is, what are your thoughts about the growing calls by Rabbi Kahana and others for a transfer of the Arabs out of Eretz Israel? Thank you very much. Thank you. Rabbi Porush. First of all, <coughs> as long as those Arabs are elected in the Knesset, we feel of them as members uh, with the all same rights like the Jewish representative in the Knesset. And uh, naturally regards the, 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 that they should decide who is a Jew or not a Jew, which this problem will discuss later on, I'm, I'm sure. I feel that that's really not in the, in the place that they should interfere in this discussion. They should have their uh, votes, their rights to decide on this. Regards uh, Kane, we are very much strong against all the way our Kane is handling the matter of uh, solving the problems in Israel. And we look upon him as a great danger for our existence in Israel regards the relations between Jews and Arabs. The question was uh, referred to Rabbi Porish, but if very briefly you would like to add anything, you two gentlemen. Can only maybe say that uh, with regard to the uh, Arab members of Knesset having a right to vote or should they participate in discussions that have to do with uh, who is a Jew or other Jewish matters, as long as uh, Jewish members of Knesset vote who will be the Arab Qadis and uh, judges, then I think it is only natural that all members of Knesset, regardless of their religion, should participate in all debate and vote on all issues. It's except not a question of their rights. Except that maybe we should uh, take into consideration that uh, it might happen that with a majority of one single Arab vote, the uh, Israeli Knesset will decide who is a Jew. Let us see the irony of this situation. Yeah, I'm sure everybody sees it. Uh, do we have another call on the line? Yeah. Joshua, don't forget when he tells you to, you're uh, Okay, yes. you're on. Yes, please. Hello? Hello? Yes. Hello, go ahead, and then hang up the phone after you answer your call. You're yeah. on now. Yeah, you're on. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Hello? Yes, uh, uh, we, we hear you. Uh, please, ask your question. Yes, uh, my name is Joshua Herbert, and yeah. I'm from uh, Los Angeles, California. And my question is directed to all of the members of the panel. Um, if the agreement up until now did not permit the opening of cinemas in Jerusalem, and uh, if indeed the uh, population of uh, Jerusalem includes a large uh, religious observant minority, um, why, why upset the uh, status quo and uh, cause this provocation? Uh, yeah. I don't understand it. Well, we'll uh, we hope you will understand it in a minute. I hope so. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I knew that the two holy words, status quo, will come up very soon. They have. Uh, Mr. Ben Elisa, would you like to start? It so happens that all three of us are Jerusalemites. And, uh, well, we all, actually, I, I represent myself, maybe. 
I do believe that Jerusalem ought to have a special character because it is a very special city. And the question goes much beyond uh, the uh, point whether movies will uh, be uh, projected on Friday nights or not. This is not the point. The point is that in such a special city like Jerusalem, of course so holy to us Jews, but holy to other religions as well, there has to be cohabitation. There has to be coexistence between everybody. And everybody should somehow feel free and comfortable in this very <coughs> special city with a lot of patience. Yes, but, but this is what doesn't exist it, today, unfortunately. It, uh, Rabbi Porush, it seems that uh, some people claim that uh, uh, the wish that for cohabitation goes only for the secular people, but that the religious people won't give in in any uh, measure. How do you feel about that? I will tell you, whatever it was the existence in the 30 years of the British mandate, in the, bad, the 30 years of the British mandate was not operated cinemas on Shabbat, because there was bylaws also in the British time that uh, Shabbat should not be operated as cinemas. The same thing in the 40 years of the existence of the Jewish state. There is a bylaw that cinemas should not be operated on Shabbat. And suddenly to break, uh, as to break something which was existent for 70 years and were in Jerusalem, that's naturally what we can difficult accept and we will not accept this. And I would like also to, to mention here, it is looking at the picture which has been given about Jerusalem before, this has been given a very a, a small corner of uh, Orthodox people who are interested in the uh, to upkeep the Jerusalem in Jerusalem the Shabbat and, and that's really not the true picture who is interested that the cinemas should be uh, as closed on Shabbat. Um, thank you. A point of history, perhaps Mr. Dinitz being a Jerusalemite, am I correct in assuming that during the mandate time there was one cinema open in Jerusalem, Rex? Yes, there was more than one, uh, uh, but, uh, but the point, I agree with my friend Ben Elisao, the question is not the cinemas, or not only the cinemas. The question is, of course, how do we live together in Jerusalem and in Israel? And I completely agree with the fact that Jerusalem has to have, it has and will always have a unique character and we must be very careful to preserve it. But at the same time, Jerusalem cannot just be, <coughs> excuse me, a holy city in disguise. It is a city in which we all want people to live of all persuasions, of all denominations, and of all trends. And it must be a city in which not only the ultra-Orthodox will feel comfortable, but the great majority of secular Jews who want so, to live in Jerusalem so should... So how do you solve this? How do you solve it? You solve it by, by agreement. It is to say, not by violence and not by demonstration, you solve it by agreement. You see to it that those things which are particularly annoying, the minority, but the Orthodox community should not be instituted. For instance, in this particular case, I don't mind to give you my formula. I don't think that public cinemas, commercial cinemas should be held on uh, Friday night. But I do believe that in clubs, that in, 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 in closed uh, circles, uh, entertainment should be provided for the young people. I don't want them to move to Tel Aviv. I want Jerusalem to be full of Jews and happy Jews, celebrating Jews, living their way in Jerusalem without the fear of being intimidated by another group. Right. And, and that is therefore what we should do. I know, I know that you have something to add, but perhaps you have a chance to do so in the next question because I want yes. to bring in another caller. Anybody on the line? Go ahead, Hello. please. Yes, this please. This is a question for Dr. Eliyahu ben Elisar. My name is Alan Weinstock. I'm calling from Los Angeles, California. Shana Tova. Shana Tova to you, How, too, Mr. Weinstock. Go ahead. How will Israel deal with the recognition of the conservative and reform movements of the United States? Dr. ben Elisar, this was directed at you. Well, our attitude is that uh, a Jew is a Jew. Uh, whether orthodox, conservative, reform, or call him whatever you call him. A Jew is simply a Jew, so we have actually no problem uh, with uh, recognizing a Jew. Uh, we do have some uh, institutional pro uh, problems of, uh, um, let us put it uh, this way, of uh, inter-synagogue uh, uh, relations. The best would be actually if uh, representatives of all trends in Judaism sit down without trying to involve the political establishment and try to reach an agreement amongst them. 
amongst religious people. And uh, uh, without uh, making out of me, who am not uh, a rabbi, neither a religious man, I am of course a religious Jew, but not a religious man, uh, or not a man of religion. I think uh, Rabbi Poros would have me, something to say about this not, uh, not definition. Not to ask but me yes, uh, to decide between right. uh, Jewish uh, trends and different Jewish synagogues. Rabbi Porush, is there really a conflict between synagogues not recognizing each other, or is it deeper than that? I would say, first of all, let us hope that our prayers, which we pray this Rosh Hashanah, we are praying the core of Pesurein and Benagoim, that God should bless us, that all the Jewish people should come to us, Israel, that would be the best solution for the whole discussion between us, between all those three uh, factors in among the Jews. Let us first of all come to, uh, to, uh, to Israel and we'll sit here and we'll find solutions for those problems. The question is not raised now. Uh, the establishment of the state, the leaders, the leaders of the Jewish agency at that time, Ben Gurion and Maimon and uh, Grimbaum, have given a, a certain document, which this should be the document and smart Israel should be handled. Like two people who are going out for a supper or lunch, they, uh, uh, one is particular about kosher, and the other one is not particular about kosher, naturally they go to a kosher restaurant. We are talking not uh, with a Jew and uh, the about to question the, if the reform or conservative are Jews or not. God forbid, this is not the question. All of them are Jews. Israel, Afropish, Chata, Israel. A Jew, even he is not fulfilling but everything, he is me, a Jew. Are they rabbis, rabbis in your eyes? I will tell you. They are not rabbis if we want to keep us here as one nation. If we want to keep us as one nation, it's difficult to accept. Those rabbis who are performing the weddings together with priests, those who have declared that who is a Jew, even the mother is not Jewish, only the father is a Jew, which is against the principle of Judaism, naturally, that's a question. But okay. I wouldn't like that this should be spread it out as a problem, which this is the problem f uh, number one for us. May I ask you, uh, Mr. Dinitz, would what uh, Rabbi Porus just said uh, not deter Jews from coming in multitudes to Israel as Olim, as Rabbi Porush prays for? First of all, I do not accept that there should be um, anything in the world that deters Jews from coming to Israel. And I agree, surprisingly enough, with Rabbi Porush on one point. I think that if more conservative and more reformed Jews would have come and settled in Israel, we probably would have had a different status quo, since we used the word status quo before, in Israel. The thing is that Orthodox Jewry was the first one to settle Israel and under the British mandate that you mentioned before. Uh, they, they were recognized as the formal official religion uh, or sect. And I believe that this, this is already changing. I mean, we have today a much greater presence of a form Jewry, for instance, with their new institute in Jerusalem, with kibbutzim that they have established, the conservative Jewry is getting a greater share in Zionist activity. This is so much to the good. In other and words, I believe if they come in multitudes, their views will carry. Of course, day. will carry and will also change the status quo and will allow, I agree also, that we are all Jews and we are the, the unity of the Jewish people, in my opinion, uh, Rabbi Porsche, will not be served if we'll say this one is not qualified to be a rabbi, this one is to be qualified. Every uh, Jew is a Jew, and every rabbi who has been ordained by his community is a rabbi. Uh, you might not want to belong to that particular congregation, My, maybe neither do I, but we cannot deprive their right and their, and their authority to, uh, to be the shepherds of the, of the flock. Well, all of a sudden we find ourselves dealing with Aliyah in great multitudes, but let's, let's hear the next question, please. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, I, I would ask my question to all three of the panelists. My mother was born Christian and converted to Judaism. I consider myself a Jew. I would like to know what do you consider me to be? I was brought up in the Jewish religion and as I said, I consider myself a Jew. And, Thank you, Carl. And, uh, well, we would like perhaps to hear, or perhaps Rabbi Porosh would want to know by whom was she converted and how. So before but, you but, ask but, this yeah. question, may Mr. I uh, yes, give please. my answer, please my, do. my position, that if uh, uh, the gentleman's mother was converted to Judaism, 
then he is Jewish. And this is, as I understand, uh, the halachic uh, solution. This is before you ask your question. Yes, Rabbi no Boris. No doubt. The old discussion is not about individuals. Every individual has a separate case, and we have to see how the case looks. If his mother has been converted, then naturally he is a Jew, and I would welcome him here in Israel. Without looking uh, to see who was the if rabbi, he is, if he uh, was... Uh, th th that's an individual question, which this is not for the public to be discussed. The public has to discuss the principles. The principle has to be, if you are talking about conversion, conversion is a term of giyur. Giyur is a term of alochic. Naturally, this uh, giyur is not a term of a, a declaration. If you say it has to be given declaration, naturally will be different. All the declarations is, is, uh, is, means a declaration which has no matter what kind of declaration he gives, but it's a declaration, but as long as he gives a deal, you miss an analogic term. Mr. Dinitz, would you find it easier to answer this gentleman? I mean, I, for me, there would be no problem. First of all, a man who was born to a Jewish mother, whether she was born Jewish, or, or, or converted is a Jew. I just want to make, correct one impression, although I sit between two bearded uh, gentlemen, <laughs> I don't consider myself a, a court of a rabbinical court to make these individual decisions. But on the basis of that... You the can't uh, reform, <laughs> Rabbi. <laughs> no. Well, no. he's got a mustache, at least. <laughs> right, I have a mustache, so maybe it's conservative. Uh, but uh, what I'm saying is, to the best of my knowledge of halacha, if the mother is Jewish, by one way or another, then... Uh, no doubt, if the mother really became converted, is a Jew. And I welcome him to Israel, too. Fine. Well, I hope we've got another Ole, possibly. Uh, do we have another caller, though? Hello? Anybody on the line from Los Angeles? You have our number on the screen at this moment. 818-701-3000. Well... It's uh, what? It's 10 to uh, 9 in Los Angeles. People are already asleep, or haven't they woken yet? And we May I clarify so about the, the, the number is in Jerusalem of religion, not religion? Well, maybe but, uh, they're, they're so satisfied so, uh, with what you've already said that no question has remained in their I mind. Would like, can I say? Yes, please go ahead. I would like to say, regards to the discussion we've made before, of who is interested in uh, cinema should be open or not open, or many are interested for it to be open or not, many not. I would like to say there is a Jerusalem Institute for Research in Israel, and they have uh, inquired about 5,000 people the reason why they left Jerusalem. That's, I'm sorry to state there are many people who are, li who are living less, less in Jerusalem. And they have 45% uh, percent of these 5,000 have said why they left Jerusalem because of housing. 25 because of housing. Housing, that's all. 25% yeah. uh, have said because of jobs. The 3% have said because of the increasing number of religious Jews in Jerusalem. I don't know what's the, why the three, if those three wanted that also religious people should leave Jerusalem. Only 1% have declared that why they left Jerusalem, because they are uh, 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 not open cinemas on Shabbat. I would like in this moment to mention something. Ja very briefly, because we have yeah, another Jacob Hazan, the, the leader of the Mapan, which is leftist elements in Israel, ever said, for two things he's sorry. First of all, why he has spoken so much that the Jewish people as a second homeland uh, uh, Russian, and he's sorry about these ideas which he brought at that time. Second, why they didn't give more religious education to the Mishmar Emic youngsters, uh, he, they, then he wouldn't face with such a shameful fact that 45 members of Mishmar Emic are now in Los Angeles. I'm okay. calling to those 45 uh, youngsters in, in Los Angeles, please come back to Israel. In Mishmar Emic, you have not disturbed with uh, not having cinemas or whatever you want on Friday night. Please well, come back I, to Israel. I wish uh, we could have had a reaction from Mr. Hazan to the fact, the mere fact that he's been quoted extensively by Rabbi Porush. I think he would have the surprise of his life this morning. But I am a great admirer of the ways how he used to handle many, difficult, many uh, political uh, problems. Um, as the call that was there disappeared all of a sudden, uh, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Dinitz, 
this idea of having all the leaders of the different communities discuss the question of who is a Jew, uh, isn't it a bit belated, considering the fact that in long ago, David Ben-Gurion tried by referring to, I think, some 50 wise men, referring this question to them and getting no results at all. And I think at that period, uh, they were really the wisest of Jews in the world. Well, that's correct, but uh, you, historically you are correct, um, but uh, let me say this. Uh, first of all, I don't believe it's ever too late for a dialogue. I mean, what is the alternative? To beat each other, to throw stones, to, to scream, to demonstrate. We have to live together. We are such a fraction of what, of rem what remained of us after the Holocaust. I mean, we, we are, we are uh, diminishing in the world in terms of demographical figures. If we would not get together and learn to live with each other, I mean, uh, wh what is the alternative? So a dialogue is good, and I don't know if it's the f wisest 50 or not the wisest no, 50. The dialogue must bring together a formula in which we can coexist. Right. The next caller, please. Hello? Good evening. Hello? Yes. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. My name is Yaakov Hanukkah, and I would like to ask the Chavel Knesset Menachem Porosh a question. Um, if they ask so much about... Um, uh, Jerusalem, why the Datim won't go finally to serve in the army, just for the fun of it. Well, I think the question was very simply. Yes, army may service. I tell you something which was really, I'm sorry that has been said so much, which is not true at all. I can only give you an example. The National Council of Agudat Israel in Israel, uh, we have 30% have of them who lost their sons in the different wars. And let us stop to, to, to play with blood. I want to tell you, the, all the religious people are joining the army. Only those who are learning, uh, studying, they are postponing the army. And let us stop with this anti-religious uh, propaganda. But uh, I'll ask the other gentlemen here if they concur with your view, Mr. Dinitz. Uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, I want to say on Rabbi Porosh personally that he is not included in the criticism that I will start because his children uh, served, served in the army and there are many... And I myself got a citation from the army. For, for the <laughs> army. Really? But the fact is, to my great regret, that there is a segment within the, Jew within the religious community, the ultra-Orthodox and other segments who are not serving in the army. And while I appreciate very much their studies in the yeshiva, I don't belittle it. And I appreciate somebody else study at the university also, and I don't belittle it. I don't think that this should in any way uh, release him or, or, or dismiss him from serving in a country where it's still at war with its enemies, who are still trying to uproot it. And there is no excuse, in my opinion, to release any segment of the population from the army, including the religious sector. Mr. ben I agree, uh, absolutely, you as uh, my colleague uh, Simcha Dinitz. May I add that it concerns a very, very small minority, which of course shouldn't exist, I agree, but a very small minority, precisely as it is a very, very small minority that demonstrates the way we have seen uh, uh, on TV just a few minutes ago and these were quite uh, hard images to see Jewish police uh, beating Jews but those Jews who were demonstrating and shouting uh, Shabbos are really a small minority even in Jerusalem out of 330,000 Jews who live in this city in Jerusalem you may have maybe 10,000 people 15,000 people uh, who are of this strand, not more. So you can understand that in the whole of the country, there are less maybe than 1%, maybe 2%, that's all. I mean, this is not the image of Israel. So we may discuss as long as we, as we wish on theological matters, on religion, etc., but not on... Our time is running out, so let's have a very brief question and very brief answers. Hello? Eitan, you can ask a question, Eitan. Please go ahead. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have a question directed towards uh, the Menachem Pogus or any other of, uh, or either Eliyahu Ben Elisal and... Uh, go ahead. And uh, Simchat Dini. The question regard is uh, to the Ethiopian Jews and uh, the validity of their Israeli citizenship and to the fact that they are, if they are Jews. I'd like to comment about that from either one of the panelists. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid we, we have seconds to answer a very deep question. Could you de deal with it? They are Jews. We are doing everything in order to save them. 
we, the, we have saved them, they are going to be Israelis, those who remain in Ethiopia will be saved as well. Not only they are Jews, but they are the finest Jews because they are Jews who have kept their tradition and, and Masoret through hundreds of years of isolation from any other Jewish community and we should tip their head towards them and give them all the love, affection and hospitality that we can in this country. Rabbi Porush. We are accepting them as our brothers. They have a problem about the past which they didn't have the, uh, the, all the religious matters and all the religious uh, customs which have been for all those years but this is not interfering in their coming to Israel. We wish they should come to Israel and everyone who end with a desire to come to Israel should come to Israel. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I think we've run out of time, no, not uh, out of questions, and I want to apologize to all those who are still waiting on the line. Not this time, but you'll find an opportunity in the future. The debate will continue in Jerusalem, in Los Angeles, and uh, elsewhere. Of course, we did not intend to solve the issue, but rather to provide a bridge, a bridge in the studio and an electronic one, television, satellite, cooperation between Jerusalem and Los Angeles. The president of Jewish Federation Los Angeles, Mr. Sten Hirsch. On behalf of over 500 member agencies and organizations, I wish to congratulate Jewish Television Network and the World Zionist Organization on this series of live broadcasts from Israel. Through the high technology of satellite broadcasting, we are able to meet some of the people with whom we have shared a long, dear partnership through United Jewish Fund, and will be able to assess almost firsthand the work that needs to be done to ensure the quality of life for Jews for whom Israel has been a dream, a safety net, a blessing around the corner, and now the world. The picture is clear. We are one people with one destiny. Well, I hope you enjoyed this first telecast and that you'll join us in the following ones. Many thanks to our guests in the studio, member of Knesset, uh, Rabbi uh, Porush, uh, Eli Ben Elisar, and Simcha Dinitz. Uh, to all of you, Shana Tova, and to you too, and a very good night on behalf of all of us here in Jerusalem. The time now here is 6 a.m. Monday morning. I am Ramevron Shana Tova. Shut up, but, but, but.